I don't know why you dragged us out to the middle of nowhere. Come on, change is good sometimes. I get that. But we could have been happy doing our usual theme park thing. We could be waiting for illuminations as we speak. We can't always be at a theme park. Besides, I think I might have the next best thing. Here, try this. I seriously doubt a cup of coffee can make me any happier about our little adventurous expedition you have us on, let alone make me forget we passed up the magic kingdom for this. Would you stop talking for two seconds and just try it? Whoa, this is good. Like, really good. Where'd you find this, Starbucks? Nope, this is Expedition Roasters, the artisanal roasters of specialty pop culture inspired coffees. You happen to be drinking Enchanted Tiki Coconut. Wait, these are theme park inspired? Yep, honestly it's the next best thing to actually being in the parks. What other flavors do they have? If you want to embrace your inner haunted mansion, they have some Happily Never After, which features flavors of New Orleans pralines. And if you want to do your best Dapper Dan impression, you can grab some Main Street USA Colombian. And the best part is that all of their coffees are gluten-free and allergen-free. That's fantastic. Let me, let me see the bag. Whoa, these bags don't look like any other coffee I've seen. That's because each one of the bags has unique custom artwork by guest artists. It makes it a little more fun to display in the kitchen than a boring bag. That's cool. They're almost collectible. We're going to have to buy more when we get home. Well, since you like this one so much, maybe when we get home, we can go to ExpeditionRoasters.com and buy some more great coffee and maybe some fun mugs and shirts, too. This means we can have theme park magic every day of the week. This is the next best thing. Do you feel a little better now? You're caffeinated and you have a little bit of the parks here with you. <laughs> much better. Maybe being out in nature isn't so bad after all. But I may prefer the animatronic animals better. This coffee may be the only type of adventure I need in my life. Start your expedition today at ExpeditionRoasters.com and use coupon code DUO15 to save 15% off any purchase of Expedition Roasters themed coffees. Brew your happy place. Expedition Roasters, an adventure in every bag. Hey everybody, Gabe here. I just wanted to let you guys know that at parts during the interview that we had with Jeff, we definitely run into some adult-oriented uh, material because we talk about Not Scary Farms The Hanging. So some inappropriate jokes definitely come up, but I just want to let you guys know that before jumping into the show. Hope you guys enjoy! Hi, and welcome to the Theme Park Duo Podcast. Grab your park map, Chiro, and hop in line with us as we take you on a coast-to-coast -coast adventure through the world of theme parks, haunts, conventions, and more. Now, here's your hosts, Nikki and Gabriel. Hey, everyone out there in the theme park world who's just as crazy about theme parks as we are. Which is pretty crazy. <laughs> welcome to the Theme Park Duo Podcast. I'm very pregnant, Nikki. <laughs> I'm very not pregnant, Gabe. <laughs> and we are the, the theme, theme park, park duo. duo. Well, after that breakfast burrito I had this morning, maybe there's a food baby down a there somewhere. Bit, yeah. that, and I mean, that definitely could be something that's going on, and I don't know. <laughs> I felt it kick earlier, pretty sure. <laughs> yeah, you did. It's all the hot sauce. Yeah, I mean, I use way too much salsa on anything that I eat. Pretty much like Nikki could be like, like the truth teller here. For breakfast, I have a pile of chilies on the side. Yeah, on that my is breakfast. True. Every time we have like eggs and bacon. That's true. We went to this like uh, like taco shack and they had like a, a ranking of their their salsas that you could choose. And of course, I got the hottest the one. The hottest one, yeah. It, it was, was called X X X Red <laughs> Stuff. I think I don't remember. There was three X's there in were front three of it, X's. which usually means really freaking hot. You had to go into the back room behind a curtain to get it. You had to be 18 and older. Yeah, I, that uh, there was no salsa there, I'll tell you that. <laughs> when they opened up the curtain, it was not salsa and I was thoroughly shocked. It was a very unique taco shack. Yes, it was very yeah. unique. Moving on <laughs> to more theme park news. <laughs> so, we're gonna jump directly into our first segment because we have a long episode for you guys. We sat down with Jeff Tucker from Knott's Berry Farm. He's a show writer over there, so we have a great interview with him all about show writing. So let's jump directly into the, the theme, theme Park, park bulletin. bulletin. Okay, first up in Theme Park news is that Six Flags Magic Mountain opened a brand new ride. It's called Crazanity. And from the looks of it, it's, it's freaking crazy. It's Crazanity. 
it is it looks so cool oh it, yeah i guess it's crazy it is it's crazy and insane yeah it is said that. the biggest pendulum ride in the u.s i believe or in, in the, the world. world in the world yeah and it is it's insane like i am dying to go on it when i'm not pregnant because that it's that's my thing like i love rides like that i love that feeling you get in your stomach and then the weight weightless feeling at the very top mm-hmm. it's 17 stories in the air it goes 75 miles per hour um and if you can check out our youtube ch- channel right now because we sent our friend allison there to experience the opening of the ride and she got to ride it with the camera pointed at her face and let's just say that she had fun but there was a certain level of fear that you could read in her eyes you can see it in her eyes <laughs> you could see it in her yes. eyes so and it's pretty uh, entertaining it's extremely entertaining so uh go to our youtube channel just go to youtube and search theme park duo you'll find the the pov of that ride so um and honestly, from all the videos that I saw of that opening, because, you know, you and I were not able to go. Yeah. It's another fantastic opening of another fantastic world-breaking attraction at Six Flags. Six Flags, Magic Mountain, always puts on the most incredible events. They do. You know, there was actors there who are on stilts and food, you know, food and drinks. And the opening, it was cool. The, the park president hit it down with this huge hammer. Yeah. Or big mallet and all the confetti went in the air. It's fantastic. They always put on a great show. And we want to thank them for inviting us over there to check it out. Uh, even though Nikki and I weren't there personally to check it out, we sent a, a representative to go to go check it out. So yeah. thank you to them for inviting us over there and, you know, always being incredible to us. Yeah. Yeah. So that is the only piece of regular theme park news that we have right now. Our next segment it's a little more scary. <laughs> yeah, that, that was real bad. Let's just jump straight into haunting headlines. Haunting headlines. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. We're supposed to say it together, but Gabe Chris. Sorry. Haunting headlines. No. <laughs> wait, wait. Okay, ready? Haunting, haunting headlines. headlines. So our first piece of news and haunting headlines comes straight from Midsummer Scream. And this is a really large announcement that they just came out with recently this past week. And I think it kind of blew everyone's minds. Oh, yeah. I'm super jazzed. So the collective creative minds behind Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights joins Midsummer Scream for the first time ever as John Murdy, Chris Williams, and Michael, 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 <laughs> Michael Aiello showcase what's new at Universal Studios Hollywood and Universal Orlando's Resorts premier Halloween event. Midsummer Scream, the world's largest Halloween and horror convention, announces that all these creative individuals are going to be on one stage to talk about one of the best Halloween events around Halloween Horror Nights, and that's going to be on Sunday, July 29th. Details of Universal Studios Halloween Horror Nights presentation remain unknown. What is certain is that there won't be an empty seat in the house when Universal's trio of terror take the stage for the presentation. No Halloween Horror Nights fan will want to miss this. So, that completely blew my mind when that was happening. That's so, it's so cool. And it's just like, it's awesome that Midsummer Scream is now like, not just a SoCal like it's 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 spreading it's yeah. expanding no it's so cool and you know the just to have representation from the other coast and to get to hear all the exciting stuff that's going on over there like in person and who knows maybe that means that they're going to be announcing a maze that both coasts are doing honestly that's the first thing that i thought about when they announced this yeah. is Okay, we're going to have a joint maze. Yeah. We're going to have a joint IP maze. Which they do. I mean, last year both did The Shining with their own takes on it, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's not uncommon, but it's super cool that they're all going to be there to announce it together, if that's what they do. I, I mean, other than having them there to talk about the differences between their events and similarities between their events, why else would we have both of them there? Yeah. That, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to my mind. And if the rumors are true... And based on, you know, construction photos, they might be announcing Poltergeist as a maze. Because I've seen those construction photos compared to, like, the house from Poltergeist, and it looks... Looks pretty similar. Looks pretty dang similar there. Yeah. Unless uh, there's going to be some type of original that both of them are going to do 
I don't know. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Poltergeist is my guess. That I'm putting that on the record now. That'll be my guess for the joint house that will be happening this year. There isn't always a joint house, but more than likely there's a joint house. Yeah. So, after that, our next piece of news on the same lines with Halloween Horror Nights. Yeah, so this one's exclusively Halloween Horror Nights in California. In Hollywood. In Hollywood. And that is the announcement that this year that Halloween Horror Nights Hollywood is going to have a maze based on the first Purge. It's Universal Pictures' all-new thriller that unleashed the country's inaugural government-sanctioned lawlessness, making all crime legal once a year for 12 hours. Murder, mayhem, and pandemonium are alive and well every year as the annual Purge grips the country, suspending all police, fire, and emergency services for 12 consecutive hours as law-abiding citizens are transformed into anarchists. Inspired by the first purge, the movement that began as a simple experiment, this terrifying new Halloween Horror Nights maze aligns with the film in establishing the motives that launched the country into chaos. The first purge maze will reimagine the movie's premise, greeting guests with pure, unadulterated fear as it brings to life the turmoil spawned by vigilantes. It will place guests at the heart of a controversial sociological experiment empowered by the new founding fathers of America's, the NFFA, desire to purge the nation of all hatred and crime by, ironically, permitting crime to take place as means of ridding society of all ills. Guests will be at the mercy of luck and speed as they attempt to outsmart and outlive the anarchy. You know who I would purge first? Hmm... The people who cut in line at Halloween Horror Nights are going to purge you. <laughs> going to purge you good. Someone, someone, uh, I forgot who it was on my Facebook. I saw it. Someone wants a movie that's just like the awkward day after the purge. Like when oh, everyone goes back to work and they're hey. like, hey, where's Greg from accounting? And oh, then, I killed him. <laughs> and then someone's like, uh, yeah, I, I killed him. <laughs> <laughs> well, you and I had that conversation of like, why are people just killing every night? Like, why Why isn't there looting? Yeah. Like, the people who are, like, parking in the red. Yeah. Like, not paying A their A minor meters. crimes purge. M- minor crimes yeah. purge. Misdemeanors. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you do during the purge? Parked in the red. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. I stole someone's mail. <laughs> <laughs> I opened someone else's mail. <laughs> It was exhilarating. You you won't believe all the credit card offers Mr. Jones gets. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, no, I think this is exciting, especially because uh, for us, we haven't really had... um, Well, we have have had um, scare zones based on the purge, but I don't think we've ever actually had a maze based on the purge. Like, solely based on the purge. The tram... The tram, uh, we've had scare zones in the the entrance. But, okay, but you know my feelings on that scare zone that is, like, in in that middle area. Yeah, it's like a mini maze. Yeah, it's a maze. Situation, yeah. Yeah, it's a maze. I mean, I I think that it, it, it serves its purpose. Yeah. I think it's fine. Um, I'm excited to see it as a full-fledged maze, especially because last year... We went to Halloween Horror Nights in Orlando, and they had their Blumhouse uh, maze, With which was section. partially yeah. the Purge, mm-hmm. and it was just claustrophobic as all heck. And actually, out of that whole like uh, trio of movies in that maze, that was my favorite portion because of how confined it felt. Yeah. Uh, with kind of like the the style of horror that's happening, and I think that's actually really cool. So I'm excited to kind of see what they plan on doing. And with regards to the maze, you know, a lot of mazes really rely on claustrophobic uh, environments to kind of help push along that fear and kind of help with the scares. Yeah. And I know that the purge really is about being out in the open during the purge Mm -hmm. and not necessarily in small areas like the first movie where you're in a house. Yeah. This one is supposed to be happening on the streets. So I'm interested to see what they're going to do with it to see what, what's going to push it along. Yeah, exactly. um, Into those, if they tend to lean towards having environments that are a bit more open, but yeah, so that's some cool news. And then after that, our last little piece of haunting headlines has to do with another one of our favorite haunted events in Southern California, and that's Queen Mary's Dark Harbor. And they announced recently that the Queen Mary's Dark Harbor, SoCal's most terrifying authentic haunt, 
will unveil its highly anticipated 2018 season at Midsummer Scream in Long Beach on Sunday, July 29th at 12 p.m. with the welcome of a new dark surprise guest, character appearances, and behind-the-scenes look at the wicked frights to come. Join the producers and directors of Dark Harbor for a feature presentation and discussion of all the new and exciting things for Dark Harbor 2018. They always put on a good show. They always like, put on a out of all the panels, show. out of all the panels, theirs I'm always the most excited for because they usually yeah. have one or one or two of their characters up there, and their characters fun. are very very good at ad libbing yeah. stuff, or at least it seems like ad libbing. It feels very loose. Well, that's what they the do every night doing. at Dark Harbor. That's true. Yeah. It's exactly what they do, and I think that the actors that they get for their characters, especially their main characters like the captain, the ringmaster. You know, Scary Mary, Chef, all that stuff. They're all fantastic yeah, actors. Yeah, the Scottish guy? The Scottish guy was uh, the Iron Master. Iron Master. Remember last year, like, one like of them drunk. was drunk? No, Not... the, the the captain was no, drunk. No, it was the Iron Master. No, the captain was drunk. Because he was sitting in the seat oh, with the bottle right. next, next to him, and he yeah. kept drinking it, yeah. making rude comments. Yeah. So... Uh, I, like you said, I'm, I'm really excited because Dark Harbor is, to me, you know, Scary Farm is my favorite mm-hmm. by far, hands down, no questions asked. Dark Harbor, to me, is like the closest you can get to Scary Farm when not going to Scary Farm. Yeah. Because of the environment. You know, the monsters are scary. They will scare you, but they also like to have fun. I love their slider show. It do- Yeah, and mm-hmm. they don't take themselves seriously. Like, yeah. too seriously, at least. Yeah. So I really enjoy the atmosphere there, and I, every time Dark Harbor does something new, uh, we're jumping at the bit to hear what it's going to be because we always like seeing whatever they have going on because it's usually extremely different mm-hmm. than a lot of other haunts that are happening at the time. So, uh, like every other year, we're pumped and ready. We're going to be there in the seats, butts in the seats, ready to see what Dark Harbor has to offer this year. Yep. So, moving on from there, we're going to jump into our main segment of the episode where we're going to be talking to Jeff Tucker from Knott's Berry Farm all about show writing. And uh, you'll hear when we're playing this section that it sounds a little different than the normal part of the show and that's because we were on location at his abode. In Jeff's living room. In Jeff's living room. (laughs) At his abode. um, Recording there with him. So it's going to sound a little bit different but still good quality there. So I hope everyone enjoys the discussion and interview with Jeff Tucker. What's going on, everybody? We are here on location, recording at a secret location. I can't tell you the address. One, I don't know it, and two, I shouldn't reveal where the person lives because that would really suck. <laughs> anyway, we're here at our very good friend's house, Jeff Tucker. Welcome, sir. Hey, it's good to be here. Well, I'm, welcome I'm, to your own, own home. house. Welcome to your own home. <laughs> at 123 Fake Street. Yes. Well, welcome to the show. This is actually, the, is this the, other than the opening uh, of season two, this is the finally... The first time that we've got to sit down and chat. Like yes. the last time, we were just walking around and you were giving us that awesome tour. Well, here's the thing. You guys are so busy. Uh, every time I tune in, you're at some other location. You're at Universal <laughs> Studios and you're at Knott's all the time and Disney and Pixar this. And I'm full time, so it's very difficult. This is a rare moment where there's nothing going on, or we've pushed things aside. <laughs> gotta, gotta savor those moments as much as you can. <laughs> take, take them to heart. But um, welcome to the show, and uh, for people who aren't familiar with you or what you do, could you tell everyone a little bit of what you do? I know that it's a lot, honestly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I invented post-its. <laughs> oh, man, you must be rich. Yeah. Is your name Romy or Michelle? Uh, well, yeah, I was going to my reunion. And I wanted to come up with something that, uh, yeah. No, uh, I work at Knott's Berry Farm. I've been there almost 25 years. It's funny, Dang. I've been helping out with new employee uh, tours where they meet someone from every department, and I happen to be, on Monday nights, the entertainment guy. So <laughs> I say, I've been here almost 25 years. Is anybody in the group under 25? And of course, everybody raises their hand. And I go, I have been here every day of your life. <laughs> and they give me that look, and I go, I'm not kidding. Remember first grade? I was here. <laughs> Remember second grade? Still here. <laughs> so, yeah, I've been, I've been at Knott's almost 25 years. I started out... As the voice of Sad Eye Joe in the jail, uh, I worked my way around from Mystery Lodge performer, street performer. Uh, I was a, a haunt monster a couple of nights. Whoa, whoa, whoa! P- pump the brakes. Mystery yeah. Lodge performer? I didn't know about that. Yeah, yeah. From from '95 
to, oh my gosh. Well, I was a performer there for about a year and a half, hardcore. Were you, were you the old man? Yes. Oh my God, I didn't even know that. Gabe, that is the only performer. Well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, you, no, well, in yeah. theme park industry, well, two seconds, I want to defend myself. Yeah. <laughs> in no the no theme park, that. people could say, like, the people who are running it can be part of the performance. Mm-hmm. Oh, sure, yeah. You could yeah, say yeah. that. You could say that, and that's me... Okay, fine. That's a slim defense. <laughs> slim defense. <laughs> but I got a little bit here. But cool, yes. I've done this show probably three or four hundred times. Wow. And then I moved up to shift lead at the building and still filled it. I, I filled in at that show up until just a year and a half ago. You, if there was a, an emergency, I would just step in because okay. it's like riding a bike. You never forget the show. In fact, we were at Austin's, my son's birthday party at the beach about three weeks ago. I did the whole show around the fire pit. Oh. And you should have seen, like, we had some theme park friends there, and they just go, oh, my God. This oh, is awesome. Because so I go, you know, you go, oh, it's you. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Oh, yeah. I need someone with me tonight. I'm getting chills. You're just Especially doing it from now. your couch. Literally, we just came out of that show. So we were at Knott's Berry Farm right before yeah. we came here, and we got out of the show and then came right here. So I, I'm trying to remember when it was. There was a time before, remember there was a time before smartphones where in your car, you couldn't listen to podcasts uh, unless you had a CD player or a tape player. You only had the radio. Yep. I had to pick up a car from Lake Elsinore. You know, it's really far. Yeah, I know. Really no Elsinore. radio in the middle of the night. <laughs> so I did Mystery Lodge all the way home to stay awake. Oh my gosh. So are you ready? To, <clears throat> nothing, nothing like work to keep you awake. Oh, it's you. I'm glad you're on Instagram with you tonight, especially now. A few minutes ago, something happened. As I was walking outside, first somebody come behind me, and I turned. There was a great large owl. He looked right at me like he was throwing through me, and then he was gone. And as he went, I think he saw my name. I mean, I know the whole show. It never goes away. But, I, but, but here's the thing. I owe so much to that show. It taught me discipline, how to do a show better. Just because you've been trained to do it doesn't mean you're good at it. And... By the hundredth performance, I was still learning how to be a performer on that stage because is there another theme park show where for eight minutes you're the only thing on stage? No. It's, yeah. it's really amazing performance. And I obviously can't give away the secrets of it, but you're out there all alone. It's you. And there are times where you, you get distracted. Dinner's ready. Or you're watching a movie backstage. And I swear, I have gone out there and I go, oh, it's you. And then I go, and... Magic, and, I, and then I go. Did I do the show? Because I don't remember doing the show. You go on autopilot. You go total mm-hmm. auto, and yeah. you start thinking about groceries and movies, and that's where you smack yourself and go, "Okay, the next one I have to concentrate," because it's so bizarre. But it's it's like a there's no other performance like that in the world because it's so unusual. Yeah. And if you go to Universal Studios Japan. They have a, uh, a sh- well, now it's called, uh, uh, what's that cat? Toke Watch? OK Watch? I have no, no it's idea. It's a little cat that comes that. out of a watch. It's an anime. Aww. But prior to that, they have the same exact type of show, but instead of smoke, it was Woody Woodpecker. Huh. It was Woody Woodpecker's yeah. animation oh, I know celebration. What you're about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm the guy that did the test show in Burbank that sold it to Universal in Japan. <laughs> so. Yeah, I've seen the show and it's very weird to like, oh my God, it's the same exact show except instead of Smoke, it's Woody Woodpecker. And I have a tape somewhere of me actually. I mean, who has a tape of them having a show where Woody Woodpecker pecks me on the head? It's really cool. <laughs> so, but anyways, back to your original question. Uh, yeah, I moved from Mystery Lodge to, uh, like, I was stage manager of the ice show. I don't know anything about ice skating, or but I became the stage manager of the ice show. Then I became an entertainment supervisor. Then I was transferred to human resources for a year and a half. Oh, but that was fun. That's different. That's because super fun. It was awful. I wanted, yeah. I wanted yeah, to I kill bet. myself every day. <laughs> the thing was, they needed somebody who could speak in front of a crowd and get new employees excited. They thought I'd be perfect for it. Mm. And in that respect, I was. But the other 90% of the job, I was just, this is just paperwork. Anybody can do this. So when there was a regime change at entertainment, I went back to entertainment as fast as I could. And I've been a supervisor there ever since until about a year and a half ago, I was promoted to show writer. So now I'm the show writer at Knott's Berry Farm. 
That's, that's awesome. amazing. And outside of Knott's Berry Farm, I know that you have a, a very popular show called 91 Reasons, which we listen to as well. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I do my own podcast, and you know how much time time consuming that is. I remember in 2014 when I started, my wife Rachel said, what are you doing? <laughs> you don't need any more projects. But out of all the crazy things I've done, novel writing, I called bingo at a club not that long ago, the 91 Reasons podcast has been so important to my family we've met more people we've gone more places and done more amazing things simply because we're able to talk on a mic in a way that engages people yeah we were at ikea about a month ago and a woman walked by and you know she's just staring at me (laughs) and i thought oh no because i wear a vest sometimes when i go out yeah and i i think i look like i work there because it happens at Target all the time. And you know what? I always just go, yeah, it's the aisle seven. I just, whatever they ask, <laughs> it's aisle seven. Uh, but this woman's like, are you the guy who does 91 Reasons? And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and she goes, <clears throat> she goes, can you wait here while I get my husband? I said, sure. Her husband was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. I was like, no, no, no. There's nothing. It's not, oh my God. It's all cool, man. How are you? And it turned out he was a fan of Random Land. Ah. I picked up a lot of listeners from Random Land, Justin Scar. Yeah. And uh, he's such a cool guy. So it's great. I mean, that might be the most important thing is <clears throat> joining the family of podcasters and more important, more, you know, directly theme park podcasters, of which I'm kind of, but not really. Yeah. There's a little family and I've had nothing but support from all these people, which is really nice. That's fantastic. And I know that you share a lot of personal stories on that show too. And it's not just... You and your family seem together, but you talk a lot about your childhood. You talk a lot about growing up and how rough it was at times. And yeah. that must be extremely cathartic to be able to have an outlet to, yeah. to well, share that kind here's of stuff the thing. at I times, to, right? I used to tell these stories to new casts when I was doing a, pro- a production somewhere. And the show was never supposed to be about that. But it sort of morphed into it. And what I've how I've rationalized it is, first off... There's a lot of people out there who had terrible childhoods and they've succeeded in spite of it. And they write me and they go, you are describing exactly what happened to me. My stepdad did this. My mom's boyfriend did this. I mean, that's always the same story, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've helped a lot of people that way because I've shown them that you don't have to be angry the whole time. You can turn it. The guy that tormented me, both of them, Berg and Roger Dole Rogers, I turned them into cartoon characters. Yeah. You know, they can't hurt me anymore. I even met Berg. Talked to him to his face. All that's... I have made amends of all that. I am good. The the most important thing is that I never knew my father. I knew him peripherally. You know, he was never in my life. And, I mean, it's ironic, right? At the exact moment I reconnected with him, he was shot and killed. So it was taken away from me in an instant. So now my kids are going to have hours and hours of me just talking about life. I would kill to have that of my parents. And my kids, they take it for granted. But I know 20 years from now, when my brain is rattled and I don't know what I'm talking about, oh, dad's stories are right here. And each kid's going to get an external hard drive with the show on it. Because right now we're almost at 350 episodes. And... I'll be able to live on forever in these recordings, which to me is pretty cool. That is really cool. And I know that Nikki and I have been talking about how, you know, we're evolving as people and changing and our family's changing. Obviously, Nikki's pregnant. You're going to have a kid. We're going to have a kid. You know exactly what I'm talking about. And, and, and we don't want to stop the show. That's the one thing we said. Yeah. Yeah. We don't want to stop the show because I think it's going to be really fun to listen back and see how our lives have changed over that period of time of where we had the show going. So yeah. there is no plan to end the show once the baby is around, just if anyone's wondering. <laughs> it's just, it's going to change a little bit, of course. Our lives are going to change dramatically. Well, the but... theme park trio. Yeah, I know, right? People, everyone's asking that. I'm like, no, 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 no. It's still a duo here. <laughs> duo plus one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's going to be fun to see the way the show changes and that kind of stuff. So I, I completely understand in that respect. Um, so, and on top of that, we're not even getting to the meat of the show yet. That's okay. <laughs> His resume is just like blue all the way down like on a big, uh, big but that's scroll. that's what I've always said about the best podcasts are not structured. They're no, just no, a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I listen to a lot of podcasts, and anytime 
the host gets the guest on a roll. They go, "Oh, we got to go back to." I'm like, "Oh, you were doing so well." <laughs> you don't, you don't want because to it was do so that. real. Like I was yeah. just sitting in on a conversation. Yeah. And honestly, like a lot of the time when it comes down to conversations, a lot of people end up thinking of things that they probably wouldn't have thought of if it was as structured as you're talking about. Yeah. Well, to me, I, that's not fun. The other main thing is. Most people, if you tell them you're going to interview them, are terrified. Yeah. So I always say, we're just going to have a conversation. Of course. And wherever it goes is where it goes. And if it doesn't, like, because not even reasons can be anything, you know. You have a specific targeted audience, and I totally respect that, because that's ten times harder. But uh, you have to keep on track, so. Yeah, it happens. Anyway. Remain <laughs> seated, please. <laughs> exactly, right? Um, no, I was going to say you also have a book series the six key book series, yeah, which is yeah. honestly, which is slowly killing me. <laughs> <laughs> I have four books out now on Amazon: the Six Key, the Lost Station, the Infinite Backward, the Ice Temple, and I'm working on book five, which is the final in the series. It's called the Tomorrow Machine, and I've taken a break from it to distance myself because you just get so. It's I mean, writing a 500 page book is hard. Editing a 500-page book, you want to kill yourself. <laughs> it's ten times as hard because you keep going over the same ground again and again and again and formatting and making it look good and not being embarrassed to sit at a convention and go, oh, that's $20. I mean, you have to... <laughs> I mean, my heart and soul is in that. So I've taken a break, but it's weird. I uh, About two weeks ago, I have all my notes, so I know exactly what the story is going to be. I just have to write it. I sat down and read... The first big chunk that I had, I wrote before I took a break and did my Back to the Future book. Uh, so I'm like, oh, oh, this is good. I like how he took a break from writing his book to write a different book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to point that out. I, I did. I mean, it's an old palate cleanser. So uh, I got back in it just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I've been doing five pages a day because that's my minimum. You can't get up until you can't you can't have a drink. You can't. I learned that from George Lucas. You can't have music, a drink, food, nothing to finish your five pages. And that's how you finish something. Otherwise, you never finish. Yeah. So I'm rolling along on that. It's a whole new um, trajectory on the book. It's not like the other four, so it's a little more difficult. But I'm having so much fun writing it. And I know that eventually, oh my God, I'm going to get to the end. <laughs> and my... What will be twenty five hundred page journey Jeez. will come to an end, and I can put it on the shelf and go. There's a complete five book series, and then of course my family's like, the six key has to have six, six books. <laughs> no, like, no, no. <laughs> I'll do the five, and then I'll take five or six years off. Then I will do the six and put it up there because I don't even know what the six would be about. Yeah. Because the fifth one's gonna close up the whole storyline. That's why it's taken so long. Yeah, there's a lot of threads to kind of make sure they're all tied together there's and stuff so, like that. You know, when J.K. Rowling writes her books, she has an entire team. So she can go, and then Harry used the, and then go, spell that does this, and then keep writing. And then <laughs> someone will go back and go, oh, that's the Expelliarmus spell, right? I don't have anybody. Yeah. So there are parts of the book where I go, and then suddenly that person's name that I don't remember right now <laughs> says something, and then I move on. Because if I stop, it'll take a week yeah. to find yeah. that name. Eventually, I'm going to have to find that name. <laughs> and I'm putting it off to the end. <laughs> well, it sounds like you, like, like you had said, your, your wife was mad at you for starting more projects because you truly do have a full plate of things that are, that's constantly Oh, yeah. If I, just, if I just had work, I'd be full. That's true. Yeah. You do a lot at but we, but we take on all this extra stuff to, you know, we, we, we chase happiness in every form, you know? <laughs> yeah. And um, and to jump more into into the realm of what you do at Knots, I know that Nikki and I have both experienced things that you have created firsthand yeah. and uh, wrote firsthand. And obviously, we're we're always impressed with the work that you're able to do. Well, at thank Knots. you. Did you see Beach Blanket Beagle? Yes, I didn't. We were gonna go today, but let yeah. took a while. Yeah, it just took a That's while. That's the newest <laughs> show in the Schultz Theater. It's our big summer show. Uh, I. Co-wrote it with a guy named KC that is so amazing at what he does. He does all the music. He does all the choreography. He is amazing. And he comes to me and he's like, okay, I, I need a storyline for this thing. And I want these characters in it. And if you've seen the show, it's not like anything we've ever done before. It's yeah. totally different. So I was able to write all these amazing beach characters. And 
give them a personality, but only with one or two lines of dialogue. Uh -huh. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and I mean, like, honestly, I'm not BSing you because I actually wrote this in my review for it, obviously, and it's honestly one of the best shows that's been in that theater in a long time. Thank you. I agree. I, I totally agree. I, and I truly, truly mean that. And my I, I'm not, my and kids liked it, which I know is... That means it's a good. It that means them, it's real yes. good. <laughs> and I, and um, I personally liked it more than the ice show. Uh, that's just my opinion. Also, you kind of hit a lot of the notes of the things that I really like, too. So I like Tiki. I like Beach. And all like the, the very classic music that's used throughout is, is... It pretty much hits all the right notes for me. And I, and I love the show. But um, as a show writer for you... If you were to if you were to just run into somebody at, at like a random store and they're like, "Oh, you're Jeff Tucker, you're a show writer," but I don't know what that means. How would you explain what a show writer is for somebody who isn't theme park uh, uh, savvy? Savvy. Okay, so in Thank a nutshell, you. yeah, in a <laughs> nutshell, it's there's a meeting and there's a decision made of a certain type of show, and in this case, we'll use Beach Blanket Beagle. Uh, we're gonna do a show with Snoopy. But it's not going to be on ice. It's going to be set at the beach, and we want these elements in it. So I get a list of elements, uh, such as um, there won't be ice, but there'll be a water element to it. Uh, there'll be tiki's on the sides. What can you do in the context of that? And a lot of it's organic. Basically, with Beach Blanket Beagle, I sat down with Casey and we talked about the characters he wanted and. Could I bring them to life somehow? So then I go back and I do exactly that. I use all of the writer's techniques to bring someone to life, such as, uh, hey, Gabe, it's cool to see you. You're a good friend of mine. This is awesome. Hey, how's your podcast? Boom. I know your name. I know that we've been friends for a while. And I know what you do. So it's a weird thing of all those sitcom tropes, you know? Hey, it's Uncle Shelley from the, from the mountains. Oh, my God, <laughs> Uncle Shelley, right? So... It's just a matter of that and getting from A to B in the shortest amount possible. And a lot of times it's writing the same thing over and over again. Beach Blanket Beagle probably had nine or ten drafts oh, geez. where things get moved around, things get cut, and you know you have to stitch them together. Oh, we cut this moment, so now we have to, the beach boy says this and the beach girl says that. Now they have to make sense. Yeah. So it's just a matter of continuing to work on something over and over again. And in the theme park business, even after it opens. Oh, so, the, has, so has it changed? The hanging has changed. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there's always running changes depending on uh, audience reaction or timing or it's just not working, that sort of thing. So my job is to always be ready to come up with something or fix, help fix something. Got it. And uh, with since we're on the topic of Beach Blanket Beagle, um, what were some of the challenges that you faced kind of designing that and writing that show? Because as you said, it's extremely different. You know, there's a water feature. There's a stage that ends up moving. Do you have yeah. to, How do you work around those obstacles when creating something like that? Well, the good news is, is as the, the, the initial writer on it, I don't have to worry about any of that. That's the, the director has to deal with all that. Oh, thank God. <laughs> I just write it all. And then he figures it out. Yeah. Like, there you go. You do Because I'll this. give you an example. Um, he had this great idea that the girls were going to go check out a lifeguard down the beach. And they needed to go down the beach to Dead Man's Cove to, to, meet, this, <laughs> to meet this lifeguard. I'm laughing because I right. know the show. So, so every time they say Dead Man's Cove. Dead it, Man's Cove. And then he goes, ah! And, and somebody screams, right? Yeah. Well, I added a little line of dialogue where somebody said, Dead Man's Cove. Yeah, that's where all that, that's where the supposed pirate treasure is. Well... That was never the end of the show. The end of the show was something... Snoopy does something amazing that saves the beach, right? Yeah. Well, when we got to it, we kept referring back to that the one line of dialogue about the pirate treasure. And I said, oh, we'll just make a pirate treasure. <laughs> well, I, I don't know. We'll figure it out. So <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's a collaboration. And I'm so lucky that KC is so collaborative that he has great ideas, but he's also open to great ideas. And we have meshed so well together on the productions that we've worked on that I can suggest something that's silly, Pirate's Gold, and how, you know how, how it's revealed. It's hysterical, yeah. right? Yeah. So you get to do all that. And part of me is also living out childhood dreams because the show is basically a Saturday morning show from 1978. 
the shows I used to watch. Yeah. Super Buggy, Electro Woman and Diana Girl, Dr. Shrinker, silly shows where, you know, people talked with, hey, we gotta go down to the beach, man. <laughs> and that's what yeah. We're not so fast, lover boy, you know. <laughs> so, uh, on the same topic, you mentioned, like, things getting cut. What was cut from Beach Blanket Beagle? Because, honestly, for me, that show felt so jam-packed with everything that yeah. I can't even imagine that there was more to it. I, it, it, it wasn't much. It might have been, I'm trying to remember, This you're talking to, one of, those, one of the things that the profession that I'm in is once the show opens and it's stamped, finished, I, I jettison it. Yeah. Because I have to I have to start working on something else. It's like SpongeBob when he has, can't remember his name and then they just start throwing all the files out. Or, to... or it's like Homer when he goes, I can't remember that because if I do, I'll lose something I already learned. <laughs> um, I, if, it might have been a music number. It might have been something. I don't really want to talk out of school because I don't remember exactly yeah. what was cut. Yeah. Uh, like you said, it's packed. So I can't imagine anything. But I know there was a couple of rewrites that I had to fix to make things mesh a little better with the characters. Mm-hmm. So, in comparison to writing Beach Blanket Beagle, how do you like writing The Hanging? Because The Hanging, to me, is the quintessential not scary farm piece of entertainment. If you're going to scary farm, you have to see The Hanging. Oh, yeah. We have friends who've never been to scary farm, and I, and they say, what do I do, Gabe? What do I do? Of course, they go to me. I, yeah. I'm the theme park guy, apparently. <laughs> and these guys, once they see the show, go... Oh, like Bill and Ted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I say, go see The Hanging. Make sure you see The Hanging. Because yeah. it's hysterical. Well, The Hanging has morphed over the years. It's changed, of uh, course. I started writing it in 2001, which is a lifetime ago. <laughs> and it, it's morphed and changed. We've done regular Old West hangings. We did the pirate hanging. We did a post-apocalyptic hanging. We did it hanging where... The main character was a um, an Undertaker guy, and the whole point was to bury some of the jokes that we had used too much, if that makes sense. <laughs> because in the early 2000s, every show... I mean, it's hard to believe, but there was a time when pop culture used to change. <laughs> like, it's even worse now, because every summer, it's the same superhero movie, the same Star Wars movie... Politically, the same it's this, the same. Right. Well, back in the early 2000s, we had this weird problem where it was always Britney Spears, Michael Jackson, <laughs> The Lord of the Rings. Harry, I mean, Harry Potter was every year almost. Yeah. So some of those jokes were like, we're going to do them one last time and we're going to put them to bed. <laughs> so I remember that year we had Michael Jackson chasing the hobbits. <laughs> no, no, no. I take it back. I take it back. It's even better. He was chasing Harry Potter because he says... You're going to be my little prisoner of Astabang. Oh, <laughs> so we retired all those, what we considered to be tired jokes, and we're like, we're going to move on now. I mean, we had no idea that, like I said, we were going to get an Iron Man, a Spider-Man, a Thor. Um, these movies that come out, it's the same movies every year. So... The Hanging Now is much more difficult to write than it was. And what am I going to say next? Why is it difficult to write? Yeah. Because there's so much. There's a better reason. Why? Because people are so touchy now, man. Oh, yeah. You can't do yeah. anything anymore. That's true. But it's so funny to me that Bill and Ted's is gone, but we still have The Hanging. That To me, that's unbelievably interesting. And to say that, yeah. I, mean, like, I, yeah. I, think, I think also the cultures of, of people who live in Los Angeles versus Orange County might change a little bit, but... I'm glad that the hanging has stayed and has persevered through that at least to a certain extent. Yeah, it totally has. You know, I, I don't know the machinations of that decision was made to end Bill and Ted. I mean, it was for, from my understanding, it was one blogger who got upset, and I don't I don't think we de- we deal with that anymore. Uh, again, I don't know what upper management at Knotts has meetings about. I have no idea. I only know the assignments I get, um, but. Do we really want to be in a place where a few loud voices can silence the entertainment for the rest of us? Well, we've already we've also already run into that problem with knots with uh, Fear VR fifty one fifty and that whole situation. Which I know I'm not going to make you talk upon that. Yeah, yeah I, I was they, involved. I, in yeah, it, so I have we, no idea. one, you're not involved in it, but then two, I don't want you to run into any problems with that. But you know, with somebody mentioning one thing, not knowing the full story, and that causing this whole huge problem. For knots. Yeah. And I don't want to see that happen to the hanging. 
Because for me, if you're going to an event during Halloween season, like Scary Farm, yeah. you know, the, and they're you know, plastered there's, everywhere, it's on the website, you think you it's know. on the maps. You think everybody knows. And there's a warning at the beginning of the here's, hanging here's, but, but there's that been, it's, it's adult content. That but there's been a change. At. Do you know what the change is? Uh, people easily offended regardless. That's, that's without, a, without a doubt. People are offended in everything now. Uh, no, here's what changed. Ten years ago, if you want to, uh, you're going to have a baby, you want to bring your baby to Haunt? Yeah. Full price ticket. I've seen somebody with a baby at Haunt. We've seen, uh-huh, we've seen babies, we've seen, I've seen kids, I think, way too young. Right. You know, anybody yeah. under 13 is too young as yeah. far as I'm concerned. But guess what changed? The pass. Oh, yeah. Ooh. So now you buy the ticket for one night. Hey, we can take the kids two or three nights. So Scary Farm evolves into this... Dare I say, family outing? No, which no, no, it isn't. We have no. seen a lot more kids the last because few years. of the past. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, because now the monetary value seems like, well, why wouldn't we? It's cheaper than a sitter. Yeah. With no idea that, hey, there's nothing wrong in modern society with an event that's not for children. Yeah. But you get into that. I don't. I can't get into the argument of. Uh, but Knott's is a family theme park. But not Scary Farm isn't. Yeah, it's after hours. There's a it's difference two there. Very yeah. different thing. But here's the thing. Let's talk hypothetical. Disney's never done an adult Halloween event. They do Mickey's Halloween Treat. Mm-hmm. We've heard rumors for years that they're going to. If they ever did, how amazing would it be? Oh, it would be, be fantastic. We talk about it all the time. <laughs> but would their fans be able to differentiate between the Pixar Fest... And the blood fest. <laughs> I mean, no, I, I they think there would be a, like a group of people who probably wouldn't be able to, but the people who know how to listen. But they've already would. got <laughs> they've already got people in vests over there that have like Mickey's biker gang on it that feel like they own the park. Yeah. So there's a real we want people to feel like when they come into a theme park, they're coming home to a place that we welcome them. We want them here. It's probably it, you're home now. But there's also that danger of, well, this is my house. Don't get too comfortable. I don't want this here, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. I mean, we're just talking generalities here. Yeah. I don't know anything about what's on tap this year. We haven't started any writing anything yet. You have to wait for pop culture on the hanging. Yeah. You know? And you have to, be again, be able to rewrite it as it goes because there have been years where the hanging victim has changed mm-hmm. or jokes have changed because something has happened. Um what was the year where something was floating across the set, and I'll never forget somebody going, "Is that Balloon Boy? Do you remember Balloon Boy? Oh yeah, Balloon Boy. Oh yeah, yeah. Balloon Boy. Yeah, yeah, Balloon yeah, Boy yeah. is where that kid in he Colorado got stuck in the balloon. Yeah, or something. yeah and floated and across three states. Yeah, and it turned out it was all a hoax. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you have to be able to you know throw those in, or 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 even you know write them and then hand them to the actor. Go, hey, th- we want you to say this tonight. It's a better mm-hmm. joke. Oh man, I, I wouldn't even know what to do if I was an actor being like told, hey, change what you've done over 15 shows already. Oh yeah, no, it's cr- they have to be on the ball, you know. And honestly, they're some of the best because running off stage and on stage in a different costume within under 30 seconds and oh. being completely different is insane to me. Yeah. I did the show one year. You did? I was in The Hanging in 1997. I, w- I wish I was, I wish I was old enough to <laughs> I have seen footage that. of That's it somewhere. Great. That's great. They, um... They had to fire this poor guy. Oh, so man. they came to me and they said, we want you to step in on like w- weekend two. Oh, geez. And I said, I haven't been to any rehearsal. Yeah. I can't do that. They said, this is what it pays. I said, I'll do anything you need, whatever you want. <laughs> so I found myself portraying, like it was, this. the hanging used to be very esoterical. It was very strange. That that year in 97, I played part of the brain. <laughs> Right? I wore a big purple... Why is that so funny? It's just right silly. I was right, right, right or left? I was the medulla. And I was a big purple gourd-shaped medulla. I, I don't... There was a, you know you that, tickled Mickey's fancy know, there. You know that line in the birdcage where he goes, you know, Martha Vale, Martha Vale, Percy Graham, Percy Graham, yeah. big God, I'm a do-. You do it all inside. Yeah, yeah. He gave me that note. <laughs> the director. And I looked at him, I said, you know in the movie he's putting that guy on, right? You can't give me that as a, a legitimate note. <laughs> so yeah, I found myself portraying part of the brain. I portrayed 
Darth Vader's wife's cat. <laughs> Darth Vader had a wife named Avita Rodham Vader, no hyphen. And I was her cat. And then I portrayed um, uh, Barry Manilow and Sonny Bono. Oh my gosh. It yeah, you're, like, you're a spitting image of something. Oh, like yeah. A, sounds oh, yeah. like the hanging in the 90s is where I needed to be. Yeah, oh, they're, they're, well, here's the thing. 97 was Haunt's 25-year anniversary. Uh-huh. So the show was a throwback to the 70s. We had oh. Wonder Woman in it. And, um, you know, Sonny Bono. And a guy kept popping up as Elton John going, Goodbye, England's Road. <laughs> We're not doing that. No, 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 get out of here. We're not doing that. I'm making fun of that. But yeah, that was weird. Here's the other thing. You know the show's full of blood and stuff, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Blood, you, you, it's these big balloons. The yeah, the yeah. blood and you, packs. You, you break them and then spew them everywhere, right? Well, for Sonny Bono, Jason Voorhees had to grab me and throw me against the gallows. Yeah. And on the gallows, <clears throat> there was this um, hinge that had the blood pack in it, and you smack it, and the blood goes everywhere. Well... The guy was taller than me that uh-huh. I replaced, so I had to jump up and smack him <laughs> in order to die. And I always thought this must look ridiculous to the audience, but no more ridiculous than could, Darth Vader's wife's cat. They couldn't lower the placement. No, too busy. <laughs> too busy. Too busy. It's so simple. Yeah, and and I know that you wrote oh. one of my my favorite jokes in Hanging History, at least. It's, uh, this guy comes out on stage, and I don't remember what year is, you're gonna know immediately what it is when I, when I say it, and you're gonna be able to spout what year, what, what the actor was. <laughs> See, now you're putting what, me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this guy comes out on stage, gets stuck by a rock on the stage, and he's there the entire show. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. he doesn't move. He's through everything that happened. That was 2011. This, Boom. Yeah. See, there you go. The yeah. guy doesn't move throughout the entire show. I, I pitched that as a goof. I said, what if a guy comes out and gets his hands stuck? Because it's 127 hours, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And Ken, the director, was like, oh, yes. And I remember the actor, I, had, I apologized. I said, I am so sorry. Because he literally had to stand there for a half an hour yeah. with his hand in a rock. But you know what? It's funny. Yeah. yeah. It's funny. You know, it's, some of my favorite jokes were, some of them got cut. My favorite joke that because sometimes, unless you see the hanging the opening night... If you come second weekend or third, you're getting a different show. Yeah. Because a lot of jokes get cut. Right? So, so some of these jokes, people might end up, <laughs> end up being so family friendly. Are oh, they... they're not family friendly at okay. all. Just FYI, guys, if you're listening right now with the jokes he's about to tell, yeah, no, are they're not, not family friendly. So, <laughs> no. skip ahead maybe a minute if you if you're easily. If you don't offended. want me to do them, I won't do them. It's no, you no, one hundred percent do them because the thing is, is that with this show, we kind of let our head head down a little bit. But I want to warn them because it is we're the, talking haunt. The haunt jokes yeah. can be even more. Than what I can say on a normal daily well, basis. I'll give you a friendly one that I loved. We brought SpongeBob out and killed him, and then he goes, "I'm gonna wipe myself up." And so they used him <laughs> as a sponge <laughs> on his own blood. I thought that was funny. No, that is funny. No, but, no. I want you to tell me those ones, just everyone. If you're if you're easily offended, just skip over in a minute. Here's what happened: uh, the wardrobe malfunction at the Super Bowl. Everybody yes. remembers that. Uh-huh. Prior to that. We got away with everything in the hanging because upper management didn't know slang. So 2003 was when we did, the the show was called The Curse of the Black Pearl Necklace. Yeah. That in itself is like, it'll keep you up at night because it was printed on all the maps. (laughs) It was Captain Jack Swallows. Yeah. His ship was the Rusty Trombone. (laughs) There was a character named Queer Eye who popped up, and he goes, hello. <laughs> he goes, where have you been, Queer Eye? I've been down in the bowels oh. of the ship. He goes, yeah, what have you been doing? He goes, oh, well, I've been um, I've been braising meat. I've been polishing knobs. And you're like, oh, my God. And um, there, was a, there was a joke in there where uh, Jack Sp- Swallows comes, you know. I'm a, it's skipping ahead a couple years. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Jack, it was Jack Swallows. Because remember, we had Jack Swallows in like he he popped up a lot, five or six hangings in a row. Yeah. yeah. But here's the thing, it didn't, it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, was, Hello, loves the people. Look, what? Women start fainting. You're like, <laughs> it's not Johnny Depp. Doesn't matter. We had a bit where in in uh, Dead Man's Chest, he's 
the leader of a tribe. Remember yeah, that movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're gonna eat him. So he goes, la, 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 and all the tribe comes out, but it's Ronald McDonald, Jack in the Box, Wendy's, <laughs> and the Colonel. Because I'm like, this is a chance to be surreal, and the hanging could be very surreal. So at the very end, um, everybody's dead except the Colonel, who walks off with Wendy. And he goes, come along with me, baby. You know I'm finger looking good. <laughs> and that all stayed. The last joke got cut. Where he turned to the audience, he goes, you know me, I come in a bucket. <laughs> and, <laughs> and the first weekend, the first weekend, you could just see the, the, the roll over the crowd. Of, oh, my God. Yeah, that got, that got cut. The uh, hanging always has at least one or two jokes where the entire crowd goes, I can't believe you just said yeah. that. Oh, yeah. Every oh, show yeah. has it. Every yeah. show has it. I well, I, uh, I call them groaner fouls because of comedy sports. It's a it's like a improv comedy yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, fight thing. In, in but LA. it's not even groans. It's just like, no, it's oh, jeez. Yeah, you're, like, you're like, I'm going to go to hell just for hearing it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can't yeah. believe it. You know. But we had some that went so quick. Like uh, for 2002... Um, uh, the Green Goblin, I Green Goblin. Freddy Krueger flew in on the Green Goblin's uh, bat like, jet thing. Yeah. 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 So Spider Man flips out, and he goes to. Oh, he, he flips out. I mean, this is. I mean, this is going deep into pop culture. He flips out, and then um, from Austin Powers Gold Member, Fuka Yu and Fuka Me come out, uh -huh. the Asian girls, <laughs> yeah. and he goes. Hey, baby, pull back my hood to reveal the real Peter. <laughs> and so they take his mask off, and it's Austin Powers. But, I mean, it's in a row. There were all these, like you said, oh, my God, jokes. Yeah. But they go so fast that nobody even realizes what happened. It goes over yeah. people's heads at times. But if, if you catch a show multiple times, you're going to hear all of them. The only time we've ever gotten in trouble was the year that Tom Cruise jumped on the couch. We had him battling... Um, the, not him, but the, the hangman is about to hang Tom Cruise when on the saloon, a giant spaceship uh. inflates. <laughs> and it's the Scientologists. Yeah. And the ship's called the L. Ron Hover. Uh. And they're, sh they're, they're okay, shooting dang. lasers, right? <laughs> and had people come up and go, you know, that's our religion. And we're not very happy. We're like, we're really sorry. I mean, we're trying to be equal opportunity offenders here. It's not like we only picked on you guys this year. Yeah, so. That's, and that's the thing is that the show is an equal opportunity offender. It isn't, it isn't targeting just one group of people or one show or one no, movie or one song. Every time we sit to write it, everybody's got their favorites. Yeah. And so we put their favorites in and then we kill, I mean, one owner writer was in the show one year because she shoplifted. Yeah. I can't just go, listen, I don't. I appreciate you not putting the thing I like in there. No, put her in. Let's do it. Let's ruin everything. Yeah. You know? My wife was into country music for a while, so Toby Keith was in the show. Nobody mm -hmm. knows who Toby Keith no, is anymore. Yeah. Of course not. One of, the, one of the jokes that I tell people when they're like, hey, what's the hanging? I'm like, well, it's, it's a show about pop culture, and they start killing all these people. And they're like, well, what kind of jokes are there? <laughs> this is the joke that I give them an example of. I say it's pretty offensive, but so they'll have the Joker come out from the Dark Knight. And he says, you want to know how I got these scars? I spent a night at Brokeback Mountain, but that's a completely yeah, different yeah. story. <laughs> and usually people just like bust out laughing. So I usually give that joke as an example of this is the kind of humor you're going to get when you yeah. come to the show. I know a guy who, um, that was the year the Brokeback guys were in the show. What do you mean? There was a year that Brokeback Mountain, the two cowboys, were oh, in yeah. the show. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And somebody, it was Jack Sparrow. Did you see where that Joker guy went? <laughs> and uh, the Brokeback guys go, could have been that way? Or could have been that way? We don't know <laughs> because we go both ways. <laughs> and and uh, it's funny. It's yeah. stupid. It, it, here's the thing. It's stupid. It's very stupid. Somebody that I respect came up to me and said, I'm not interested in talking to you anymore because that's an important movie to me. And I said, we make fun of everybody. I said, Heath Ledger's dead. Yeah. And that Joker's in the show. So what do you want to do? You want to get, if you can get offended or you can just go, it's a joke. Yeah. Have a sense of humor. And the thing is, is that when you're going to hunt, you have to know what you're getting into. <coughs> right. The joke. Do you remember the Joker's last line in that show? No, I don't. That was an, that was a joke at us. It was about, we, that was the year we hung 
the guy from there will be blood. Because yeah. he represented yeah. the oil barons. And the Joker goes, you're mad, aren't you? Right? You wanted to go to Universal, but the gas costs too much, so you're stuck coming here. <laughs> I mean, that's a slight at naught, yeah. so it's all good. But at yeah. least Knotts has, has the sense to make fun of themselves. If you can't make fun of yourself, you're done. Exactly. exactly. You know? so. did, were you, did you see the year we did Wonderful World of Water? Yes, it was fantastic. Yeah, that was Ken, man. That was, was so brilliant. Was that also the same year that you had the song with Osama Bin Laden singing Under the Sea? Yeah. Yeah. No. Um, oh, was it, that was that wasn't the same year. Uh, it might. No, it might have been. Some yeah. of them are really blended. Yeah. Yeah. Osama yeah. bin Laden. It was the year Osama bin Laden died. And they dumped his body. And they in dumped the ocean. his water in the ocean. So in the hanging, he was singing a version of the song "Under the Sea" from The Little Mermaid, but the lyrics were akin to his dead body floating under oh. under yeah. the ocean. What are you gonna do? Right? It's I, funny. It's really funny, and I mean, like Nikki and I are people who aren't offended very easily. Yeah. Like, you have yeah. to do something real bad in order to offend us. Mm-hmm. And we think The Hanging is a perfect opportunity to let down those, you know, the, the guard yeah, and, and, and let, ga- let down your hair, so to speak, and just laugh at what life is. You're being yeah. sensible, though. People oh, aren't who's sensible. sensible? Yeah. No, who's sensible? <laughs> I know people aren't anymore. They have no... They have no... No safety what, net. What is fun about life if you're so concerned about getting offended at everything? Well, as long as you can laugh at everything, come on, that's what life is. I go on Yahoo, my homepage, to get to my mail, and every day on Yahoo they have an article that solely consists of tweets, where a celebrity tweets this, and then somebody tweets back that they're upset, and then they tweet at each other, and at the end you go. <laughs> If I wasn't on Twitter, I wouldn't even know this existed, exactly. but apparently it's news. Well, a lot of celebrities and kids' celebrities have been, like, bullied off of social media for various reasons. Even the girl from Star Wars, I forgot her character's name. Oh, oh Rose Tico. Rose Tico. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, Kelly it's, it's, it's getting yeah. crazy. And That's this, ridiculous. Especially online, people feel a sense of entitlement to speak their mind, and they feel more empowered to do so. Well, I think... It makes uh, yeah, people bullied. I agree with you, and I think part of it is what I call the pajama syndrome, and that's where you go, I'm at home, I'm in my pajamas, how could I get in any trouble? Yeah. Well, easy. The cops can show up at your door if you start, because people have put death threats up not realizing yeah. it, yeah. and there's a knock at the door, and like, everything counts. Yeah. I have a Twitter account. I don't use it. It's connected to my Facebook so what I post on Facebook goes to Twitter, but I never engage people on Twitter because Twitter seems to be this island of offend people people who are offended. Yeah, and I don't get it. And I've learned all these terms that I just I don't care to learn. Like you can throw shade at somebody on Twitter. Oh, that's just yeah. a young people thing. People but say then, that in real but life. But then they clap back. Yeah. <laughs> and I just think we're. <laughs> How all, dare you, Jeff? We're all turning kind of dumb. <laughs> I don't understand any of it. Yeah. <laughs> we're well, in the don't same worry. Boat. No, I we think we're stuff. in the same boat, too. We hear stuff all the time that we're like, what? What, what does that mean? Yeah. What, what is acronyms We, we now? were in the McDonald's by knots eating, and we were listening to a conversation of some, like, pe- pre-teens, like, next yeah, to us. I think they were, we like, had, 12, right? We had to Google what they were saying. <laughs> we Googled We were what over the words here were. like trying to decipher their conversation. And I'm like, we're not that old. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> yeah, no, we are. I mean, we are. Everybody is. Yeah. I know, right? It's insane, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. You ever watch the biggest example, Kung Fu? Remember Kung Fu? It was an old TV show where yeah. guys go into the Old West and he doesn't want to fight anybody. Like, he can. Why? Yeah. If you mess with him, but he's practicing inner peace. I do the modern day example. Oh, it's fireworks in my name for that. Yeah. Modern day example of that is, I, here's the thing. I don't fight with people. We were talking earlier. I don't want to fight with you. I don't want to fight with anybody. You have your opinion. I have mine. It's great. That's what America's about. Differences of opinion. The, the, the definition of freedom of speech is me defending to the death your right to say the very thing that offends me. Mm-hmm. I agree with that. By that token, I am the ultimate example of restraint because at least twice a day, I see something that just gets me on social media. And I type out this amazing response and then I delete it. (laughs) Because I'm not interested in fighting. I'm just not. I'm a man of peace. (laughs) (laughs) Well, back on the track of 
show writing. Yeah. <laughs> that I don't delete. <laughs> yeah. Save everything. Um, we've been talking about the hanging for a while. I'm not sure if that's it, but what's your favorite thing you have written or, you know, any piece of uh, material, the, material, yeah. material for the hanging or just, or, in, just in general? What what's, is... what's the favorite? What's your favorite thing oh, you've I, ever written? I possessed. That was actually, oh, yeah. and that was a one-off too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. we love that. Yeah. And I can tell you exactly why, because the year before we did two shows in Mystery Lodge using the Hall of Vision effect. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the first year I overrode it. I, I went way beyond what the audience is capable of even understanding. The plot of that was, we are welcoming you to the Haunt Institute, the archives, where one of everything is kept right below us. So during the course of the show, he starts releasing all the monsters from all the mazes past. Mm-hmm. And I was like, this is great. It's like Kevin in the woods, and it's different. The audience is like, I don't have any idea what's happening. That right. was the one time I did miss that, so I actually never got to see that. Yeah, he didn't miss anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I, you learn from your mistakes. And what I learned on Unearthed was less is more. Give them just enough to hang a plot on, and they will fill in the holes. Yeah. So in Possessed, you never actually saw anybody possessed. It wasn't the exorcists or anything like that. What it was was this really weird, sterile, what am I looking at? It's a doctor, and there's a patient, and there's a ghost or something? I don't know what... And then. But what it allowed was this feeling of dread. Yeah. Like, it just had this... And Possess only lasted about seven or eight minutes. It was pretty short. That's the Mystery Lodge show. It's only seven or eight minutes. It does That's all you can... That's funny, because Mystery Lodge feels long to me. That's because you had the pre-show and all that, but the actual presentation is only about eight minutes. And I knew that going in, right? Um, but the first time we presented it to an audience, and the ghost turned and talked to them, and they responded, I went, oh, wait a minute. We might have done it here. And we did. Me and Rob, the guy that put that together, would not have predicted it. And again, you learn from what came before you, like Jurassic Park. You sit on the shoulders of geniuses and use their research, right? <laughs> There's a moment in Possessed that I'm so proud of that's so silly. And that's where the doctor shows you a projection of a house, a murder, and it's all these slides on a screen. Yeah. And then you see Maggie, the yeah. ghost, played by my daughter, mm-hmm. and she starts to move. And you're like, oh, cool, it's a projection on a screen. Cool, man. And then she walks off the screen. <laughs> it's the easiest effect in the world. But no one had ever done it. I couldn't believe. I did research. And suddenly, that moment of her walking off the screen, even though, remember... The audience is sitting in Mystery Lodge. Behind yeah. glass. They've seen the Mystery Lodge show normally, right? Yeah. You know what it's capable of doing. When she walked off that screen, people gasped. <laughs> it's because, forget the effect, it was the story. Because suddenly the crazy girl's not crazy, and we're buying everything she says. You know, that's, you asked, I mean, those, those are the moments I'm most proud of. And we have it on tape. The moment I'm most proud of yeah. is sitting with Doug Barnes and company from season pass. The show's about to start, and I pointed to a guy in the audience. I said, that's the guy that's going to lose his mind. <laughs> and at the finale of the show, Maggie turns and goes, now I want to play with all of you. He stood up and he goes, you ain't playing with me. <laughs> <laughs> and Doug goes, how'd you do that? I said, he was on edge the moment he walked in. <laughs> so the minute the show went from... Hey, I'm watching it too. That's watching me. That's where we had him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what was the most challenging project that you've ever worked on? Well, I'd say pos- no. The most challenging was trapped. <laughs> possessed. <Yeah>. Trapped <laughs> was the Every most answer challenging. is possessed. No, possessed was was hard because yeah. of the um, technical things of it. Mm-hmm. But I never felt over overwhelmed. I always felt like we'll get it. We'll get there. We'll get it. So everybody, slow down. We'll get it now. But that's me and like six people. Trapped was me and 50. Yeah. So there were moments in Trapped, especially during year three rehearsal, we had a heat wave. It was about 110 in the building without air conditioning. And there were moments of that I thought, I, I can't do this. I can't. I, I've, I've bitten off. The show's too big. Because Trapped was ultimately, above all, it was a show. Yeah. That was yeah. the moment I thought, I've, I've, I don't know what I'm going to do. But I, thankfully, it wasn't me. It was the cast. The cast stepped up and said, 
we're going to make this work. And I've, I've experienced all three years of Trap. Nikki experienced year two and year three. And I could definitely say that if we're looking at this like as a trilogy of movies, year three is the perfect ending yeah. Yeah. to the where Trapped you, series. Where do you go after that? Exactly. After killing them. <laughs> yeah. Fake killing you at the end of it. Like, that is the, literally, that is the perfect ending yeah. Yeah. you could possibly write for any show that yeah. includes interaction like that. It's because there was no horror movie trope of escaping. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. In every horror movie. Even, 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 like I said, Cabin in the Woods ends with the main characters going, we've destroyed the world. We did. Yeah. Have a, have a bong hit. You know what I mean? <laughs> but in Trapped, it was, no, nobody, and people left Trapped like they were leaving a funeral, their own. You're like, oh, yeah, that was great, man. <laughs> Honestly, I could definitely tell you that that last yeah. room, which if people haven't been in it, basically, they fake hang you. They put a noose around your neck. They put a hood over your head, and the floor drops. And yeah. that was the only time in haunt history that I've ever been that scared. Like I don't you, like I don't like ties. Yeah. I don't like ties. <laughs> so the fact okay. that somebody came around, put a hood over my neck, and put the rope around and my a neck, weighted rope and a weighted rope, yeah. so it felt like it was pressured against my neck. I was actually genuinely terrified. I was I was worse off the second year when you ended in the fake room. Oh my god, that was so and amazing! The fake ending, the like fake bar, yeah. yeah, like I, I was, I like, I went in there. I was like, okay, I'm done, and then I was like, no, I'm not done, and, and the, then I was like, where do I go? The best part about it is that there was it, the room was filled with you know zombie weird people that kind of started gravitating took, towards you slowly. It took you a second to realize that. And I was fine. Like I started moving towards the what I thought was the exit, but yeah. And year two, we also didn't believe anything we were being shown or told at the same time. Like, the exit here, says it's the exit. Yeah. But I didn't believe you. Yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. want to go that way. So I was over near there. Nikki was on the complete opposite side looking for something. Everyone just started surrounding her. Yeah. And then by the time we even got near the exit, some guy was like in the curtains and just grabbed her. <laughs> it yeah. Was fantastic. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> it was fantastic. But no, Trap was definitely one of, the, one of the best experiences we've had at Knott's. And I could see how something like that can be extremely challenging with how many working pieces and how many cogs are actually in that yeah. machine. Well, I've always said it's easy to come up with a scary maze like that because it because Trap didn't have a plot. No, it the, only plot, pl the plot is to get out. The only plot was success and failure, success <laughs> and failure. But th it's easy to come up. I'd go, hey man, we'll do a room like this and will this and happen and this and that. That's easy. The hard part is it has to be reset Yeah. in five seconds for the next group. So you're constantly thinking two steps ahead of the reset. And the, the challenge of Trap Year 3 was the um, the plant, yeah. the fake guest that you encounter. Yeah. Because when I wrote it, I didn't know how those actresses were going to get to all those points on time. And I challenged them. I said, you guys are going to have to figure this out. You know, And if you were backstage, you would see people racing down hallways. They go, everybody move, and then someone would race down the hallway <laughs> to get into the robe, to get into the noose. And sometimes, like, as the door was opening, the helper was just leaving the room, so you never saw them. Jeez. There was so much going on behind the scenes that it, full credit goes to all those people. There were dressers. There were reset people. I mean, it was crazy. Wow. Yeah, the I hood, can't imagine The that. hood you wore... Yeah. Had to be put in the laundry and a fresh one brought out. Oh, yeah, every time. Everything has to be reset. Uh, the, the the time that we put the noose and the girl pissed herself, we had that, stop, we have to clean it up. Only use track B now. Mm. So, yeah, a whole... So, what happens then is, even if you solve the room, the door doesn't open. They, the actors probably had to kill time. Yeah. Yeah. So, imagine, like, you're watching... I, mean, I felt like John Hammond watching Jurassic Park and all these yeah. monitors... They're entering the T-Rex habit, <laughs> the, the paddock. Here we go, you know. And honestly, I'm still mad at you because you made me waste money because I genuinely thought there was another way to go in there and there was not. So we did it twice. So we did it twice. I was yeah. just talking with somebody about that. <laughs> the biggest fight we had on Trap Year 3, because you have to imagine, the people who build these things, it's it's a miracle they're finished on time because they're so intricate. Yeah. So you start having to make choices and things get cut. And one of the first things they wanted to cut was the fake doors. You can't cut the fake doors. And I no. said, I said, no, no, we're trying to give the illusion that they really are in a maze and that there are other routes. Yeah. And the first or second night, 
a woman in a electric wheelchair came to me and she goes, I have to know. Is well, I saw other doors and I said, you'd have to go through again. I have no idea. <laughs> and suddenly, like you, <clears throat> there's repeat customers. Yeah. Illusion of choice. Yeah. And it worked. Yeah. I mean, and that's a testament to the writing. That's a testament to what you're able to do and how you're able to control people in those types of environments. Yeah. It's also, again, like the actors, once you left the um, the pit room, right before the unicorn room, there were three doors. Only one of them went anywhere. Mm-hmm. But the the one that went backstage, that's where the, the plant would come from. And she would time it so she's coming through the door into the pit as the pit door is closing. And then the other door is magnetic. So before you get to it, it's now locked again. So again, there's all this idea that if I could just get through there, you know. Yeah. And and one last point before we start moving on is the worst part about it, I think, and the greatest part about it is when you get your key taken away, the first thing you see is I door with a whole bunch yeah. of locks on yep. it. Yeah. And you think, well, what if I kept I think the that key? was Gus's idea, and I was it's, like, oh, that's so brilliant. Yeah, he was trying is, to keep the key the second mm, time. It is so <laughs> fantastic, and it's so well done. So yeah. I, I applaud yeah. both you and Gus for doing that. Yeah. that it's well, fantastic. If Trap had continued, the one thing I was trying to push was taking Gus in the perception of, I'm suddenly backstage. Uh, Interesting. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like I'm through it gets that very door. Meta. <laughs> like you ever see the Truman Show? Yeah. yeah. You know when the elevator opens and he sees people like having donuts? Yeah. And it's like and they go oh and the door closes. Yeah. Wait, what's that? Yeah. That's the, the moment I wanted of like I wanted somebody to turn and go. You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> this is not part of the maze. Oh Where my are God. you supposed? Like that moment of oh my God I am, and you wouldn't realize until after you left like oh that was part of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. That, that would, would be have interesting. Been really great. Yeah. That would have been pretty cool. You would have gotten me in my uh, my fear zone if you had had like a security guard. Be like, that's what I mean. Yeah, no, a guard that's, going. She would have freaked trouble, out. Getting in trouble is like my biggest. You want to get thrown out of here? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like oh my god. Yeah. You would have gotten her so oh bad. Oh my god, I would have started oh, crying. That would have been great. Have, <laughs> like I'm gonna get game kicked out of scary park forever. <laughs> awesome. Worst, it would have worked. Worst fear. It would have worked. It, yeah, it <laughs> I'm, I'm getting all like anxious thinking about, about it. Uh, so moving on, if you had a dream job for show writing, what would it be? And it could be at any theme park. It doesn't have to be knots. It could be knots, but any theme park. What would your dream like the dream assignment? Yeah, yeah. the dream assignment for show writing. Yeah, I don't know. There's so many. Like I've grown up writing, not writing, but watching movies and <clears throat> dealing with properties. You know. Uh, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, it would have been to write a Star Wars show. Mm-hmm. But now I'm not so sure. <laughs> I mean, Star Wars is so out of fashion now and so lost in the in the galaxy, you know? But I'm bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what I'd love to write? And this is silly, but they keep talking about it, which is why I'm so irritated. <clears throat> they keep talking about a nighttime Universal Studios tram tour. Oh, Ooh. yeah. Didn't they, they did do that for a hot second. Yeah. It wasn't for a long time, but they did do something like that. But you would see Doc on the clock tower, a lightning bolt, the, the DeLorean, and then flame trails. I'd love to help put that oh. together. I mean, that would be really bitching. That'd be pretty cool. incredible. Yeah. And uh, we asked a few people on Twitter if they would submit some questions to a show writer. Obviously, I didn't reveal it was you or whatever it may be because I didn't want the, the questions to be too tailored to like... Sure. Jeff, Jeff, what do you do it? Not to write in the background. something good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Were you gonna do something good? No, um, no, just about show writing in general. So some people submitted some questions, and um, one of the questions was, how do you balance participation uh, and a cohesive narrative with really large groups and shows at theme parks? Depends on the audience. I wrote a show for one of our other parks. I mean, I don't think people people realize that if you go to. Uh, Great America. Great America, Kings Island, Kings Dominion, uh, Cedar Point. Uh, Anything in the in the, in the Cedar, Cedar Fair family. You might see something I've wrote because oh, I, 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 I write. I didn't even know that. I, I didn't write know a, that either. Yeah, I wrote this uh, really cute peanut show about them going to the beach, and when I got the notes on it, it said we need a section where there's a beach ball that they bump around as a this and oh yeah sure so. I, it depends on the audience. If it's a, if it's a kiddie show, then you definitely want that. Um, if it's uh, the hanging, if you throw a beach ball, they're just gonna keep it. That's, yeah. that's a very good point. Yeah. So you just have to balance it. You know what? What will the audience take? And also the venue. 
if the venue's inside, they may be less apt to get out of their seats and dance in the aisles versus a show that's outside because of the perception of, I'm in a theater and I shouldn't get up versus, hey, it's fun, we're still in the park. Yeah. And you know what's funny is that, uh, going all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, Beach Blanket Beagle, they come out into the crowd. Yeah. But people get out of their seats for them, which to me is incredible. And I mean, kids are loving it. Even the show that I saw, some girl was like, you stopped dancing with me. And she tried to go back on to stage with them. They're Um, very pretty people. (laughs) That goes a long way. (laughs) Uh, Another one of the questions was, how do you connect with audiences without directly addressing, like, individual people? How do you connect with them on a certain level for them to be engaged? Well, it... hmm. It's easy when you have the Peanuts characters mm. because Something familiar. there's nothing, there's no educating. You know that Charlie Brown's a lovable loser. You know that Linus is the overthinker and Lucy's the crabby boss. That's easy. Um, if you're doing something new, it, it mm. a lot of times, this is really funny, there's a show we're running now called Captivities where it's a camp counselor engaging the children. Well, there's not really a writer on that because you go... Hey, who likes to go camping? What do you bring? What do you bring? The kids make the whole show. Yeah. So there's not much to it. It, it just depends, you know. Well, well, if you're actually writing a script for a particular show, not like not like the camp counselor situation, but are there any techniques in writing that you would use in order to facilitate that? To engage them? Yeah. Like well, any you, particular thing yeah, that you well, would use. Yeah, well, the character of JT, JT, which is the human character in our show, she's the only one that can really go out and talk to the audience because the characters obviously can't respond in in real time right yeah. but JT will we'll write stuff for JT like what's your favorite thing, animal at the zoo or animal on the farm and get the kids to make those noises that sort of thing is that what you mean yeah to a certain extent yeah interesting okay and then obviously the last but not least and the most obvious one and I know that your situation is a bit different but how do you become a show writer for a theme park your situation is very different and unique. Because yeah. you started at Knott's and you just went through the ranks. You went up the ladder. Yeah, what happened was, I'll tell you as quickly as I can, in 1998, they had they had never done a Peanuts show at the park. They had done one-offs here and there. There was a Peanuts rockin' show or something, but never one that was just for kids to sit down and watch Peanuts characters. So they came up with something called Sidewalk Theater because there was no theater in Camp Snoopy except one for Smokey's animal friends. What? Smokey Smokey Bear. Okay, Smokey Smokey Bear. Bear. Gotcha. That would be kind of cute to have him back. That's kind of cute. Yeah, he was a cute character. Um, But uh, they opened it up and said, if you can write a show, we will pay you for it. So I wrote 20 (laughs) because this was my big chance. Yeah. And they picked three or four. And I actually got for the first time to walk into a theme park and watch the Peanuts characters saying stuff that I wrote. That was really amazing because I was, what, 25, 26? That must be surreal. I was like, oh my God, I'm writing the Peanuts character, even a song. There was a song about Charlie Brown saying goodbye to his friends because he was moving to Ghost Town to be a cowboy. (laughs) Really cute show. But that showed, hey, that guy that works at the Mystery Lodge can write. Yeah. So that's how I did it. But it's it's like any profession. Whatever you want to be good at, you just have to keep doing. I, I feel like there's no right answer. To yeah, that there question. isn't. And it, like the theme park industry and world is just evolving so much. I feel like the answer you would have given ten years ago is different than. The oh, so different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you hear people <clears throat> say, "Oh, yeah, I used to go to Universal and jump off the tram and just walk around and." Talk to random people. Like, yeah. Yeah, you're not going to do that anymore. You know, now you're a terrorist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mean, I guess the answer is kind of a, a here, multi layered answer. Here's what I'll give I'll give you some life advice. If you're a young writer out there, and we all start out young, the first stuff I wrote was in high school. I wrote a one act play that we performed, and then I wrote a three act play that we performed. And at that point, that was my big moment because <clears throat> I was in something called uh, Gate. Yeah, I was yeah, I know again. Gifted yeah. and talented education, yeah. <laughs> which they had changed because the year before it was called MGM, which they would go, "Oh, you're a mentally gifted moron." Oh, I go, <laughs> I'm on. The, I I was on the other side of the gate. <laughs> yeah. I was in gate, and gate goes through elementary school, and the show that we did was my senior year. It was my big project, and on opening night when I came back <clears throat> just to visit the audience, 
all of my gay teachers were there. <laughs> and they were like, we knew you would do something. It's like, oh, that's awesome. So the best advice is start, if you are if you want to be a writer, you have to write. I know plenty of people who tell me they're working on something. They haven't started yet, but they're working on yeah. it. Writers write. And if you want to work in this industry, here's the best advice I can give you. Stay off of social media. Stop spouting all your opinions. Nobody cares. Because your employers will look at that. Yeah. And if you come across as some sort of weirdo, they're not going to hire you. They're not going to. They're not going to tell you it's because of Twitter. Yeah. They can tell you it's because of something else. Because I, I have personal friends who go on Facebook and they're screaming about their boss. And then two days later, they're like, I can't believe I got fired. <laughs> and I go, roll back your social media because we were just talking about how it seems like you can just spew whatever you want into the world. You should be. You should. Here's what you should do. Consider yourself a brand. You guys are a brand. You're the theme park duo. You would never go on and trash somebody on social media. No, no. Never. It would be out of your out of your wheelhouse. You wouldn't do it. But a lot of people feel that they can. Yeah. That's where that Star Wars nonsense comes from about people bullying and all that. Be nice to people. Because the people you're nice to might want to hire you. How about that? That's a good yeah. that's a good place to start. Just being a good person. Be a good person yeah. and write. <laughs> because you know what? You're gonna write a lot of crap. I have boxes of papers from my high school, my college days of stuff. I wouldn't let anybody oh, read. Oh, dude, the first feature-like script I wrote was terrible. I wrote a play <laughs> that my wife said, this needs to be burned. <laughs> it was terrible. As she was burning, she's like, needs to be burned as her arm went And, you know, and you know what happened? I, I went back to the drawing board, and I wrote a completely different play that I ended up producing. And up at that point, it was the most polished work I had ever done. I was so proud of it. Nice. Yeah. So you're going to suck. You're going to hate your work. And here's the thing. The sixth key, I finished the first draft of that in 2004. I didn't publish it till 2011. Yeah. Because I kept rewriting it and rewriting. I rewrote it so many times, I hated it. I wanted to burn it. I said, no one's ever going to want to read this. I hate myself. I hate the book. <laughs> and then you, and then you, then the relationship changes. You, you don't hate it anymore. Yeah. So, keep writing. Because ultimately, when you do work through all those challenges, which there are a lot of challenges with with writing in general, but also show writing, ends up being something that you could be proud of and something that's yeah. rewarding in the end. And knowing that you're standing in Camp Snoopy watching the Peanuts character spout the words that you put on page yeah. months prior is such a rewarding experience. My my mom died early. Yeah. She never saw... Nice any, transition, well, by the way. She never saw any of this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I would just look at it through her eyes and go, wow, my mom would have been amazed that they're doing this show that I wrote. Now you I know? feel like a dick for making a joke. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. I, 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 people ask me the other day on Facebook, what, what offends you? One thing offends me. Censorship. That's it. There you go. And I'm not. And it's funny I'm saying that after you should. So you're, no, you should be nice. Be a nice person. Yeah. If you start from that avenue. There's a difference. You can't go wrong. There's a difference. Yeah. yeah. But um, if you're going to be a show writer for a theme park, be prepared to have your work eviscerated in a room full of people. They'll tell you how terrible it is, and you will go back and make it better. Yeah. And you'll thank them for it. How about that? That's. I mean, it's going to be don't rough get, when don't people get offended. Yeah. It's going to be rough when people do that, but it's the only way to make your work better. I've yeah. probably written 50 or more shows that have never seen the light of day. For knots? For knots, sure. Yeah. All the time. So you just, it, the job. It's just you got to brush it off. Oh, yeah, no. You just go, hey, I got paid for it. I, that's a win. Yeah. You know? <laughs> or they didn't go for it, you know? Yeah. Don't I thought, that. see, I thought Tommy Toon was popular. <laughs> so I wrote a sequel show, and the powers of me were like, we would never do this show again. Are you out of your mind? <laughs> I was like, yeah, I guess I get that. <laughs> but at least it's with you in your memory. Forever. Oh, yeah, sure. So, But thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with I us. I hope I wasn't about, boring. Uh, definitely, definitely. Trust me, not. you're definitely not boring. <laughs> I know that we definitely wanted some tangents there, but I mean, like, that's part of the fun with talking with you is because you have so much history at Knott's and there's so much that you've done that there's so many interesting facets of, of your work history there that we kind of just go down all these avenues. Well, there at, I know we're wrapping up, but there's there's only a few of us left that were, that started when the Knott family still owned the park. Yeah. yeah. So I've seen all the regime changes and how 
the the park has changed, and I can honestly say um, this is the greatest the park has ever been. You know, the people in charge now really care about the place. They want to present the greatest show we can, yeah. and I get to be part of that. So I'm very I don't ever dread going to work. Yeah, That's awesome. and and the one thing that I tell Nikki almost every single time we go to Nods. And I say, this is the one theme park that I go to that I love seeing packed. I like yeah. being at Knott's when Because you packed. probably remember when days were when it wasn't. Yeah. When it wasn't, and it wasn't the best that it could possibly yeah. be. And the fact that the park is thriving, and the best that it possibly can be, and that people are loving it, and just seeing people's smiles on their faces at a park that I care so much about makes me so happy. And I don't care that it's crowded. I don't care. I love it so much. Yeah, there was a weird time in 2009 or 10 where I was actually working both parks. I worked at Disneyland, too, for a really short time. Oh, you were the uh, part of the band, right? I was the mayor of Frontierland. Oh, yeah, you were. Oh, okay, there you go. And I was also Jedediah Jones over at DCA with the minor 49ers. That's what what I remember. But I actually got to write a show with the writers over there. For the Disney parks. And I got to see the differences between the two. And that's why I'm so grateful that Knott's is a place where anybody can have an idea and it can come to fruition because Disney's so not like that. Yeah. You know? It was a much more strict. Yeah, just there's a lot of departments there. You gotcha. know? We, we wrote a... Ken and I wrote this really funny show about uh, these, these... The worst cowboys ever putting together a posse. Right? Yeah. And uh, the one guy goes, he goes, you got a gun? He goes, well, of course I got a gun. I got it from right over there. And it's one of the shooting gallery guns yeah. with all the wires sticking out the end. <laughs> and I just thought, that's a funny joke. That's hysterical. Well, that took like six weeks oh. because somebody had to make that. And I was like, I can make it overnight. Like, you're not allowed to make it overnight. I was like, oh, that's all these channels. I'm so not used to that. Gotcha. I'm used to knots where you just... Rub, you roll up your it. sleeves and do it. So. Yeah. Well, like I was saying, <laughs> we could go on and on. There's just so much that we could talk about, which we're probably going to have to do a part two at some time. Yeah, Any time. It's gonna. It's probably going to take another three seasons to get. Like, <laughs> yeah, you do your show <laughs> in seasons. Yeah. So we take breaks. <laughs> I don't know what that's like. <laughs> what, it's quite nice. What What are breaks? January, February, <laughs> are relaxing. Really, I, I do watch. one to two shows every yeah. week. Since 2014. With, I've taken a couple of breaks because of illness. But I usually put up a, an old show. Yeah, at least you have something to put up there anyway. Yeah. But yeah, no, we definitely take breaks. But yeah, we're going to have to do a season, uh, another episode at some point. Because there's just so much to talk about with the theme park industry. But thank you again for joining us on the anytime, show. Anytime, anytime. Uh, make sure to plug yourself. Let uh, everybody know who's listening how to find you, your show, book, everything. Go on iTunes, search 91 Reasons or Stitcher. Or just put it in Google. It'll come up. 91 Reasons. Uh, you might get an article like 91 Reasons Why Summer is the Best Time. I've seen these weird articles. I'm like, they picked a weird number. That's a lot of Yeah, that's, that's a, a lot, lot of reasons. reasons. Yeah. Uh, mine is called 91 Reasons because I thought of the podcast idea in earnest while I was driving the 91 freeway. I mean, that's really the only reason. So I just, originally I was going to record the show on a microphone while I drove home. Because I used to spend an hour to two hours on the freeway. Um, I did that one time, and I almost had a car wreck. So I realized that's not the safest thing to do, to talk no, while you're driving. Probably not. But the title stuck, just because it's different, you know? Yeah. yeah. Because I don't know what it would be if I... What would be, like, pop culture fest? I don't know. Something silly. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> but, yeah, 91 Reasons. And then if you go on Amazon, my books are The Sixth Key, The Lost Station, The Infinite Backward, The Ice Temple, and then my newest book is... Your Friend in Time, How Back to the Future Changed My Life, which is a really fun book about Back to the Future and all the ways I have tried to enter the film and live my life in Hill Valley, <laughs> including <laughs> jumping off the tram and walking around Hill Valley. So. You crazy man. I know. You terrorist. <laughs> so, there you go. On that note, thank you again so much. Anytime. I honestly really love sitting down with Jeff and talking about 
what he does for a living because you could tell there's a lot of passion there. Oh, definitely. The, the guy loves writing. I mean, for crap's sake, he has a series of books. Mm-hmm. So I love just hearing the ins and outs of what he does and, you know, where the ideas come from and things like that. And that's personally why I like listening to a show, too, uh, 91 Reasons, because sometimes he'll share things like that. And recently on an episode, they just shared a whole bunch of these things from Scary Farms past that he helped write. Yeah. And uh, to me, that's just really, really fun. They're great stories. Like, we got stuck talking about The Hanging for a long time. I'm sure we could have gone on for a whole other hour. You I know? mean, if you guys want to hear an episode all about The Hanging, if you guys are Scary Farm fans, let us know on social media, because we could definitely make that happen. We could have a whole episode about the history of The Hanging. Yeah. And, uh, and, and if you want to hear that, which, you know, if... If people aren't familiar, which I think we did talk about in in our interview with him, but The Hanging is a satirical show all about pop culture. They kill them in every se- every season of the show. They kill them, kill them off, whatever the worst person is of the year and things like that. So it's very dark, uh, very dark um, humor. D- yeah, it's very dark humor, mm-hmm. very uh, not PC yeah. at yeah. all. So um, it's that's the kind of show it is. And diving into what was happening that year and kind of talking about the show as a whole would be kind of an interesting topic. Yeah. So if you guys want to hear that, let us know on social media. But as it is, that ends our show this week. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in on this awesome episode. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if you want to connect with us, guys, on social media, make sure you check out us on all the social media platforms, which includes Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We have our own YouTube channel. We release YouTube videos every now and again. Oh! What? I have... Well, we didn't talk about it in the opening, but I want to talk about my trip to Universal Studios. <laughs> Just briefly. That's fine. I'm... I'm... Putting on the brakes. <laughs> Stop. I went to Universal Studios, and... <laughs> <laughs> Don't look at me like that. Nothing. It's just what you did. It was funny. You literally and figuratively put on the brakes. I did. <laughs> um, well, I went to try the butterbeer ice cream, as well as to experience the two new locations that they have for the interactive wands. And the butterbeer ice cream was fantastic. It was really good. It not quite as butterbeery as I expected, mm-hmm. but still a good flavor. It was more like vanilla with like threads of flavor in it, if that makes sense. You know, you, like you could see it. Um, but it was good. It was refreshing. It was like 90 degrees at 10 in the morning, so it was great. Um, and then the for the two new experiences, they're right to the left of the um, train station can't miss them one of them is that big door that used to go to nowhere and now it's it's interactive so you go up to it and you say alohomora and all these gears on the door unlock and then you hear this roar and like a red light from underneath and fire and smoke well no fire it's just smoke it's It's red it's like a red Red orangey light glow yeah and 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 so you're unlocking the door but oh no there's a dragon behind it so that's super cool (laughs) (laughs) oh no dragon (laughs) oh no dragon and then and then right next to that one is the incendio charm location where you say incendio and fire bursts out of the top of a smokestack and so that's super cool too it's super fun yeah so i just wanted to share that i had a great time at universal studios acting like a wizard and it was pretty fun a witch a yeah, find a witch. And <laughs> and then, oh, and then they, they had a few new things in the stores, too. You can buy Snape's cape. Why are you laughing at me? I was sincerely hoping that you were going to quote Princess Pride when I said that. You're a witch. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, moving on. But after on. what you just said, I'm not sure I even want to be that anymore. <laughs> uh, I still do. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you can buy Snape's cape, like, a real, like, cool replica of it. They have it like on a mannequin. James from Creepy Kingdom took a picture in it. You could look him up on, <laughs> on social media. You could see it. It's pretty amazing. And then and then they have like real high quality replicas of Hermione's dress from the Yule Ball. And what I think is super cute is they have uh, versions for little girls too. <laughs> they're so they're tinier. It's so cute. And then um, they have they have new robes that kind of billow. They're supposed to billow around the bottom. And then they have um that they have sweaters that were actually knitted in Scotland, um, and they, they, you know, they're the H and the R, like the ones yeah. Mrs. Weasley made. Yeah, yeah, 
I can't believe I forgot to even mention that at the beginning of the show. I know. That that's was a big what, thing for that's us. why I halted the show. <laughs> and I, I, One, I apologize for missing out on your experience. <laughs> Two, I apologize to, to Universe Studios Hollywood for forgetting to mention it. And I also want to shout them out because that's fantastic that they brought us there to check it out. Yeah. It I was, mean, it come was on, so what's, much fun. What's better than spending a morning at Hog, Hogsmeade? Honestly, think about it. Like, how else would you want to spend your mon- or your what is it, Monday morning? Thursday it was morning? A Thursday morning. Thursday morning. How else would you want to do that? I took off work to go have butterbeer and hang out in Hogsmeade. Nikki, so. why are you late to work? It's being a witch. <laughs> <laughs> I only told my boss. I didn't tell anybody else. S- didn't she? She's like, what fun thing did you do this time? <laughs> yeah. Well, no. She's like, well, I asked for the time off, and she said, why? Even though, like, <laughs> like I don't, knows. I don't have to tell oh, her. Yeah. You know, like legally, I don't have to tell her. But I was just like. Something fun, <laughs> and then I told her because I don't care. But it was it was a great time. Yeah. yeah. So shout out to Universe Studios Hollywood. Make sure you guys go uh, check out those new additions to the land. I mean, honestly, on top of everything else that's being offered there, uh, with regards to the Wizarding World, this only fleshes it out even more. Yeah. And I, I think that adding more spells really makes it feel a little bit more active and real than yeah. any, anything else. And, and, I, and two, I love it. These two in particular, it's like every other spell location is kind of like behind glass. Yeah. These two are like more real life, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, like yeah. there's the ones where you would make like paper blow up in the back and things like that, or like sound to go off. And like you said, it's all behind glass. These two things are not behind glass. They are out in the open. Yeah. And they're in the environment, which is kind of partially the reason why I feel like it really adds to fleshing out the environment of Hogsmeade as opposed to it just being like a theme park land. Yeah. It feeling more like an actual place. Yeah. Which I think is really great. And I, and I love any additions that they could do there because it just makes it even more interesting to stay and hang for a long time just to watch people interact. Because mm-hmm. even though we may not be doing the ones or be doing the, like the spells and stuff, I love just standing there and watching kids act like they are in the Harry Potter films. I don't know about you, but I do the spells. Well, you're part of the kids that I watch who act like they're part of the Harry Potter films. You know, running around, you know, with their wands, yelling spells at each other, and, you know, doing the spells and really getting into it, you know. I, that brings so much yeah. joy to my theme park heart to see people doing that. Even when I was even there. Even you doing it, by the even way. Even when <laughs> I was there, like, there was a, an adult at one of the locations. I mean, he was just moving his wand in the formation which realistically that's all you need to do and a little girl was like no 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 you need to say the word too otherwise it won't work you know and she fully (laughs) believed that you know with all her heart and it just that made me smile no it's cute it's really cute that everybody gets so into it yeah and um no yeah so it's great additions to the land and i can't wait to go check it out because i haven't checked it out yet Mm -hmm. have butterbeer ice cream but i have not tried out the new spell (laughs) so i'm really excited to go bring my uh voldemort wand and Try that out. Yeah. Slytherin. 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 <laughs> anyway, moving on. Yeah. Uh, social media. Social media. <laughs> Make sure you follow us on all social media. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. All you have to do is search Theme Park Duo. And if you want to do us a favor and head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star written review, that would be fantastic. It really helps out the show. It helps so much. Yeah, it brings us up higher in the standings. It makes it easier for people to find us. So you have to type less letters into the search bar before we pop up. What do you mean? Well, like, if we pop up faster. Yeah, that's true. It'll make your life easier, yeah. too, if you do it. Yeah. yeah it's helpful, <laughs> see? So just leave us a five-star written review over there, and we'll give you a shout-out here on the show. And if you want to reach us, make sure you email us at... ThemeParkDuo at gmail.com. Yes, of course. And that's it. Once again, thank you, everybody, for listening to this week's episode. We really hope that you guys enjoy the product that we're spitting out here because we have a really good time recording it yeah so thank you again and always remember there's There's always always a great great, big beautiful beautiful tomorrow tomorrow. see See ya. ya thanks for riding with the theme park duo make sure to gather all your belongings before the end of the podcast Bye bye